Professor. Thank you very much for inviting me. My name is Wolf Tetzlaff. German name, but you can see right away I'm an immigrant, like most people in this country, and I am very much like to come to Canada because Canada was the leading country in neural regeneration work in the 1980s. Yeah. Yes, it was. Uh, very important findings were made in Montreal in the Aguayo lab and uh, by Richardson and others and David Agua and David uh, Sam David. So that really was the mecca to come to initially, and so I enjoyed myself as a student here, and uh, never returned back to my own country, which now Canada has become my own country. So uh, I like to give you about five minutes as an overview why people think about cell transplantation therapies for spinal cord injury, just to introduce in the next slide um, the concept of spinal cord injury. And most of you, I just have to click on this here, yes. right? Yeah. Yep. Most of you know that transplantations are being used in many clinics all over the world. Some clinical trials have started, and they're usually in the early phases, meaning people try to see whether it's feasible and possible to inject cells into injured spinal cords. And those early phase trials are typically done with an open knowledge for the person who agrees to participate, as well as the clinicians knowing who received these. So it's very early to actually conclude anything. And there are, in addition to those very serious trials, a lot of clinics advertising cell therapies when you go on the internet. And these clinics are typically not within the jurisdiction of US or Canada. They're typically outside. And they do what we typically summarize stem cell tourism. And we very much advocate not to participate there. And if you have further questions, I'm very happy to elaborate. So these are the two facts. But the, unfortunately, the fiction is so far is that some uh, cell transplantations are actually providing any benefits. We simply do not know that yet. It's too early to conclude any final facts. What we know so far is that Certainly, they are feasible to some extent, and in many cases, they seem to be safe, but I'd like to elaborate on this in my talk. Before I go into further detail, I'd like to remind everybody what it actually... Oh, sorry, this is the old one. I see, I take it out. Sorry, this is the old one. Sorry for this. Uh, we have a misunderstanding here. It doesn't matter. The spinal cord... I just have to go one back. Sorry, I uploaded the original... Oh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Um, I didn't mean to talk that long, and I'd just like to uh, remind everybody what the spinal cord is. The spinal cord, in essence, is this tube-like structure, a lot of nerve fibers in humans, millions, and rats, hundreds of thousands, are running down from head to tail. They talk here to these nerve cells, which are sitting further down in the spinal cord in the gray matter. Oftentimes, these are motor neurons that are sending commands to the muscles. And when the spinal cord happens, these nerve fibers that come from higher centers are interrupted. And this should now, I have to go here one second, I apologize, are interrupted. This is often by a bone fragment that fall into the actual spinal cord itself. We get a, a hemorrhage, a bruise, and over the next couple of days, there's secondary damage, a whole cascade of damage. And this leads to an expansion of the lesion site itself. And in the wake of that, those nerve fibers that were not interrupted by the primary injury are now interrupted by the secondary injury. And many of them are losing, at least in animal models, losing their insulators. Nerve fibers are like a cable where there's a wire of copper in the middle and some plastic insulation material on the outside. And these little sausage-like structures are these insulators. We call them myelin. And there is this demyelination going on, the loss of these insulation. And that typically leads to a conduction block of these nerve fibers. So the thinking is the low-hanging fruit would be to bring cells in here, which are restoring the conduction of these otherwise not interrupted nerve cell processes to get this going again. And the other high-end thinking as well, ideally, 
we would be able to also repair the damage. And I come to that in the next slide. I just tried to tell you what is not happening, because I have to. Sorry, I have to, I have to get to the technology here. Uh, because when you have the demyelination, there was a failure to conduct impulses. I mentioned that, and unfortunately, the effort of the cells from the nervous system that are sent down there, the processes, the effort to regenerate this little process here, gets usually uh, stuck in the actual scar tissue that forms here, and regeneration is typically failing. And that's, of course, the major reason, in addition to the conduction block we, I described, that the centers below the lesion site are no longer, no longer receiving the impulses from above, and paralysis and functional deficits therefore occur. OK, a role for stem cells, and this is the last slide I bother you with, is essentially uh, to have cells that may be able to bring in these insulating cells and remyelinate this sheath along the spared rims of the spinal cord. That would be one thinking. Another thinking is you have cells that are able to actually survive and integrate in that lesion site and build bridges, which can be then used for the nerve fibers to grow out again and hopefully reconnect with the nervous centers below the lesion site. And even other authors think, well, maybe we can put in nerve cells or stem cells that make nerve cells that can receive an impulse from above and then themselves are sprouting to the lower centers and thereby produce relay stations, very much like in a telephone wiring system. You have those relay boxes, and they would then essentially take the impulse from above and relay that information below. And so there's this kind of thinking, and we have to admit that oftentimes cells have just what I would call more nonspecific or broader effects because some of them are modifying that secondary damage, the inflammation, and therefore, they're somewhat beneficial to help the endogenous repair mechanisms in the injured spinal cord. So I leave it that way for the time being and uh, allow you guys to ask questions. I'm happy to elaborate if you have further questions, what's going on, what type of cells are used, because there's an ongoing debate. And uh, we have slides in the collection there to discuss those things in detail. So I, I think I'll start off with some of the questions here because, uh, you know, in our discussion the other day, um, you had made some points about uh, the differences in research uh, between other countries and Canada. First, first of all, financial, yes. actually speaking. So if you can elaborate on that, that'd yes. be excellent. Of, of course, stem cell trials, as they are happening or have happened in the last little while, have turned out to be enormously expensive. We know, for instance, and everybody has probably seen in the media, there was a trial with embryonic stem cells. And these, this trial was conducted by German company. Mm -hmm. And their financial department calculated that the cost per patient would be in the order of $487,000. And they treated five patients, technically four, but they treated five patients. And at that point, a new uh, executive moved into the company, looked at those numbers and said, wait a moment, to show efficacy, you may need hundreds of subjects because you enroll so early. And each half a million dollars, that's in excess of hundreds of millions. And they said, for financial reasons, we don't want to support that. So this was a major roadblock to go further with a trial in a company that otherwise seemed fairly healthy, although I have to say, all stem cell companies lost a lot of stock, almost stock from the 90s to this decade. So his, their stock was $30 higher 10 years ago than it's today, where it's one dollar, uh, and the other one at two dollars. So therefore, we, we see actually uh, a lot of financial pressure on these companies. And to make this a profitable um, a treatment is probably somewhat optimistic. I think this is a treatment for these companies that they do out of the good of their hearts, out of the high profile it uh, generates, and also they can then use this type of uh, information together for diseases which have a way larger clientele and, and therefore become more economically viable. So that's but you're you're speaking about the private the privatization that's of, of research. That's so. absolutely correct. And um, we, we saw another uh, company like 
uh, pro neuron, which had the same difficulties and also for financial reason folded up a trial. So this is to answer questions: Why do we not have more trials? And those were trials conducted in part or entirely in North America. Okay. So why do not we have more trials in Canada? Obviously, is we don't have those type of resources. That's the first clear answer, and it would take an enormous amount of money to go beyond a phase one trial. And the other reason is. We have still an ongoing discussion in Canada, which is uh, how to proceed in the most effective way that uh, to take animal data and take the animal data and say, this is now a sufficient body of evidence to translate into human beings to go clinical. And the, this is very interesting because on one side, there are the people saying, let's take mouse data, let's take rat data. and take them and just go to the trial. That's mm -hmm. the one position. And the other position is saying, wait a moment, we don't know enough, we don't have enough evidence that it's really robust enough in these rodent models. We need to develop a, as an intermediary uh, to think about sizing up the spinal cord is much bigger in a, in, a, in a human than it is in a rodent, and putting cells in is not the same in a rodent, which is three millimeters big, but human mm -hmm. is 10 millimeters big. And therefore, there is uh, this group of people that clearly advocate the usage of some intermediary model. And there's the extreme in that group saying, well, we believe we need to use primates because mm -hmm. primates are telling us most likely how the human cord would respond. And very interesting, one of those laboratories recently at a, one of those consortium meetings was showing us data in primates that, monkeys in other words, uh, that clearly showed that you can do injections in a rat and the spinal cord does not suffer. When you do the very much the same injections in a monkey, you lose motor neurons. And that's very, very troublesome. Mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it would tell us that we don't understand right. sufficiently enough from our rodent models with regards to safety issues. And that is taken up the whole initiative by the paralyzed veterans in the States. Again, there's more money. The right. paralyzed veterans have way more money. Mm -hmm. You probably know those numbers better than I do. And these people are now creating, or have created a couple of years ago, a consortium of researchers yes. that setting up these primate studies in order to address these type of issues. So if you would try to bring that into Canada again, yeah. the answer is we don't have those financial resources to do okay. that. Okay. And it would be nice, but the good news is the good news is the border between Canada and the US pretty much has dropped when it comes to science. We are we like to believe we are one big North American uh, mm -hmm. consortium and leading scientists from Toronto, from Vancouver, are actually clinicians, are participating in the North American Clinical Trials Networks. And oh, they, are, they are essentially part of this group of clinicians that like to get ready for clinical trials and that have actually started some, some trials, not with stem cells, albeit, but with drugs that pre should prevent this secondary damage right. I was talking about. Oh, so that's really interesting. It's something we, I don't think we'd heard about before. So. You know, regardless of the, the state of affairs here in Canada, we should be looking at it as a North American state versus an uh, so. individual country. I, I think so. We are relatively small as a country yep. uh, that we should be just looking north of the 49th. Mm -hmm. We should really be opening ourselves up. and But at the same time, we should, of course, support our own homemade initiatives. There are quite a few. I can talk about them if mm -hmm. you like, yes, uh, and talk about what stage they might be in in this regards to translation. And to that initiative, for instance, my colleague Brian Quan and I mm -hmm. are, are inviting some 25 scholars in the field, not just North Americans, some also from Europe and Asia and Australia, to discuss exactly those guidelines, which are just uh, tried to uh, allude to, how far should we go with regards to going from a rodent to a human on one side, or having some intermediary models here. What type of evidence do we like to see? What type of evidence is robust enough to justify a trial? What type of severity of models do we see? Because oftentimes, animal experiments are done in rodents 
that are still walking. And you would probably hesitate to put a, a human who is mm -hmm. still walking mm -hmm. uh, into mm -hmm. a trial like this because right. the gain is relatively minimal and the risk is maybe too high. Right. So there's actually this a bit of a disconnect in some studies. So we have to come to grips with saying what type of models do we want to see. There are those done, but many are not done that, uh, that in my mind in models that are too mild. And we have to find an agreement and come up with a it's possible, a list of recommendations to hammer out this roadmap to a trial, which I mm -hmm. think is useful because it would allow us to most likely, and if we, nobody knows that for sure, most likely lower the danger of failure. I, I'm not saying you can never predict uh, that you will not fail because for two reasons. A, nothing has worked yet, yes. and therefore you cannot compare yep. anything to a gold standard, which makes it so difficult. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, uh, human, as they arrive and are injured, are coming with, with all type of differences and variabilities. And in order to group them, in order to just have a more homogeneous study group, you're reducing the number of, 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 of individuals dramatically, which makes it extremely slow, which requires, again, a network of clinicians in different centers. And this is exactly the type of initiative that the Rekansi Institute likes to put money into to actually create those, 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 those networks between clinical centers and enable the actual conduction of such trials, which is immensely complex and we all overlook that initially. And that is something which, when you look into detail, it's actually very difficult to do these trials. So since you brought up the Rekansi side of things, um... You know, there's always been a lot of questions exactly what the involvement is uh, from Rick Hansen Institute and, or the foundation, and there's a bit of confusion with that. So are you able to elaborate on that a little bit? I, um, yeah, I think I can. Uh, I happen to sit on the advisory board for the Institute, and I believe it's not a secret to say that they're most likely get renewed over the next five years with a good amount of money from the government. Yep. And I think that's not a secret. Um, and the business plan is to actually support five clinical trials. That's in the business plan. And their mandate is to translate what we know and to translate what is promising into human uh, reality. Will they be able to financially fully pay five trials? I personally doubt that. If they should they involve cells, it will be way more expensive than if it's just a drug. But they will be able to initiate support, provide the initial framework for those. And then, mm -hmm. of course, we have to raise more funds yep. in order to follow through. Uh, so I think they, 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 they have this kind of mandate. And I hope that they will be able to fulfill this. Um, we will see. The future will tell. Um, what are they, what is there is already, as you probably know, a North American Clinical Trials Network mm -hmm. that is at the moment studying a neuroprotective drug, a drug called Rilozole. Again, we have to see how, how successful this is. But to the best of my knowledge, there is not a stem cell trial or a trial with cells. And I have to explain later on, most cells that we use are not stem cells. Um, to tell you the truth, we actually get try to get away from the stem cell itself, rather differentiated, because some stem cells have a uh, tumor risk. Right. They can make all yes. type of cells. Yes. And if you put them into an injury of a spinal mm -hmm. cord, you actually can generate tumors, and you don't want that. So that was the major reason why the JRON trial was so expensive, because they had to follow up and had to promise so many follow-ups on the people, right. three months, every three months, MRI, and all these things. And they could only very slowly progress, because they had to wait a long time to see whether there is a tumor evolving oh, I see. before you can do more people. Yep. So that by itself delayed that uh, process. And this is where the business plan people, the high executive said, mm -hmm. yep. we, we don't like to, to put more money into that. Well, so they're looking at it from the business model. Absolutely, which, which is very sad, yes. uh, because you would hope uh, people would be a little bit more philanthropic, but business people mm -hmm. can't do that. They, no, they, no, no. they have investors, they, they, they trade at the stock, and their decisions are pretty much driven by stock. Well, that's a problem when they go private. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you do research through private institutions versus uh, you know, government funded or, yes. or scholarly. And that's very interesting what you say there, because if you have a private company that tries to bring a cell to the market, they just talk to FDA, 
or in this recent case to um, the Swiss regulatory agencies, Stemcell Inc. did that, and the ongoing trial in the Western world where everybody's looking at is a trial in Switzerland mm -hmm. with a, a neural stem cell line from Stem Cell Inc. And obviously Switzerland was not as strict as the FDA, uh, and I was told there are more risk taking, similar to the Germans, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the FDA is quite conservative. Mm -hmm. Health Canada is also very conservative, I have to say that. Yes. Uh, it's mainly because they haven't done a trial yet with cells. So therefore, it's new land for them. They have to wrap their head around the issues that may arise. And if it hasn't happened yet, they are uh, understandably uh, right. cautious, right? Absolutely. Uh, and so uh, this trial has, I believe, enrolled now three or four people, but we, we see data on three so far. And it looks like there are some sensory recoveries, but I can talk about details later. It's way too early to say something because there were three people. One patient shows a little, the other one didn't, and the third one, uh, mm -hmm. and you never know really what the reason mm -hmm. for that is because there are no control groups. And uh, even if you would just touch the cord and put a needle in, you may see things like that. And they were still in an earlier phase between three months and six months where there is still some recovery spontaneously occurring. So we cannot say very much. The only right. thing we can say it's going on. Yes. Uh, it looks like it hasn't done major damage in those three individuals. And we just wish them good luck and see what happens with that trial. Uh, is, is it heavily supported by animal data? Not as much as many people would have liked to see. And this is why when it comes to public dollars, mm -hmm. the researchers have to agree what kind of criteria we like to see in animal models in order to proceed to a trial, because in that moment we ask the taxpayer to right. support it. It's a different decision. Absolutely. So going back to the question of animal models, you had mentioned that uh, here in Vancouver, Dr. Kwan and, and colleagues, I'm not sure if, if you're involved in that one also, are looking at developing a different model. Yeah, we just got, uh, Dr. Kwan, uh, uh, just got the paper accepted in Journal of Neurotrauma in which he describes a pig model for spinal cord injury. And can you explain a little bit more why looking at Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Uh, the pig, of course, is larger than we are, uh, larger than mouse, mm -hmm. almost our size. So the spinal cord of a pig is about seven to eight millimeters. The spinal cord of a uh, human, I said it before, close to 10. So when you put cells in, when you have to think about instrumentation to inject, when you have to see how cells survive, and all these questions which are rather mundane logistics, but very important question to solve before you do a trial, you do in a pig model. Mm -hmm. In this case, in this intermediary. Why do we do pigs? Because in this country, most people have pigs as uh, food animals. Most of us are not emotionally attached mm -hmm. to pigs. Mm -hmm. We do not do any work in dogs. We do not do any work in cats. So all we do and I think it's emotionally uh, too stressful otherwise for ourselves, all we do is mice, rats, and pigs. And uh, that does not mean that somebody somewhere has to do a small number of primates. And right. as I mentioned that the paralyzed veterans do it in a center in the state, so my colleagues work on it in a center in the state. And I think, personally, it's the right thing. If you have reached to a stage where you say, once we learn what is in there and we have the evidence, we might be able to, to go to translation. And that keeps the number of the uh, individuals, in this case monkeys, low. And yes, it always, always is emotionally hard for people to work yeah. with them. I have to admit that. Uh, it is not, uh, it's not easy. Mm -hmm. They are essentially only uh, 5,000 generations away from us. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. So here, I mean, uh, that sort of model has been researched in America, and uh, some of the Canadian researchers are involved in that. Would there ever be a chance of that happening here in our country, or is it you just... Mean, you mean primate trials? Primate trials. Um, I doubt it, mm -hmm. um, for two reasons. Uh, the cost, and the other reason is, um, for the, the cost reasons can be offset probably to the American centers, and it be done there, or even Chinese centers now because they are, right. they are gearing up. And yes. in, a, in, a, in a few years, they will be so reliable that you probably can uh, do these type of things in China. Really? And it's much cheaper. 
Yes, yeah. I know colleagues of mine have go exactly that route. Okay. And so okay. so there is uh, there is that, and uh, I would expect that this is happening in the next uh, some some years. I, I think also the attitude towards permits there is a bit like it's a, it's a crop stealing nuisance, and um, which I find a bit sad. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's 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 just cheaper because of the per personnel cost. That's really what it is. Because when you do a primate, you, you open up a hospital, and you have 24-7 intensive care. Yes. You need it all because the, it's necessary, like yes. for humans. You, you have yeah, to yeah, treat yeah. them like humans. Yep. And that yeah. is enormously expensive. Mm -hmm. And um, for that reason, and even the, 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 the pig study is enormously expensive. We calculate that every single pig, because we need so many hours of the vets around and all the care we give them in order to make the suffering absolute minimal, uh, that takes about per pig $50,000 easily. And this is, the, this is the necessity of the, of the experiments. And I right. think um, we are ethically and morally obliged to do it as professional as possible. And this is why the, the conditions under which they are operated and treated are essentially human-like. You wouldn't be able to tell the difference of the OR there. So, so essentially, you're, you're you know, also exporting research to China, you know, or or importing results from China for for research. I mean, okay, uh, resources. I I would resources. Say. Yeah, it's it's our experience that when we talk to Chinese colleagues, that they're very open now to collaborations, mm -hmm. and the the Wisconsin Foundation is also open to open ourselves up to international collaborations. Mm -hmm. I think Rick has this vision that if we collaborate more internationally, we will be faster. Mm -hmm. And I think there is some truth to that in, in those aspects, and uh, that would be one of them, perhaps. Right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree. So uh, maybe there are questions from the audience. I don't know, but I'm very happy to say one more word. Our own vision is to use cells which are coming from the skin. We work in Vancouver with a skin-derived cell that has been discovered by our colleagues in Toronto, and they can be. Uh, differentiated in a tissue culture dish to make a sort of glia cell as it's typically found in the nerves. And these uh, cells are guidance structures. So they're actually doing exactly what I tried to show here in that slide. They go in the lesion site and form these type of bands and, and allow axons to grow and nerve fiber processes to grow into the lesion sites and, and through them. And this is what we favor at the moment. And we favor it actually not in an acute phase after injury, but one or two months in the wilderness, we started two months after injury, because this has ma major advantages. If you treat a human being, let's say, three to six months after injury, that would be probably a, the equivalent. Uh, that individual has time to think about the injury. Yes. That individual has time to talk to other people that have the same uh, type of accident and can plan their life accordingly or say, well, no, I like to go in for a trial. And therefore, it's ethically much more justified to step to the bedside and say, uh, hey, I have a cell for you. Because if you do that in the first couple of days, the chances are that say yes to everything. Absolutely. And that, I think, is, is problematic. It's, that's not really true consent because you're so overwhelmed. And the other reason is, um, we, if we are allowing this little interval, we, and most people are receiving surgery for spinal cord injury, we should be able to take out a sliver of skin culture it. In the meantime, the person who's thinking about it recovers. And we can actually, after about three months, the clinicians can predict more precisely where the person might end up with regards to the final function. The noise of spontaneous recovery is much less after three months. Right. And at the same time, we can grow up the person's own cells and put the own cells into the body. So right. we don't need any drugs for immunorejection because oh, drugs for immunorejection are inherently problematic because the, these uh, individuals with spinal cord injury are prone for infection and have other risk factors, and you don't want to load up another risk factor, i.e. Uh, immunosuppression on them. And this is why we feel it has made three major advantages. Uh, you can get away with fewer numbers in your trials because the noise is less. You uh, have an ethically much more able to make a decision, a consent decision-making uh, uh, individual who participates. And uh, as I said before, um, it's, you don't immunosuppress and you um, 
I think I got that trip. Yeah. So um, that's our own vision here in Vancouver. Yeah, you're perfect. I, has someone uh, joined us? And um, Brandy, is that you that's joined us? Yeah. What? Oh, sorry. That, uh, can you read that there? So, or, if Brandy, if you're on there, you can just go ahead and ask a question. I probably didn't give her audio. Or, <laughs> sorry. Give me one second, Brandy. I. Okay, I turned your mic on, Brandy. Sorry, I forgot to do that. Uh, Prince George, uh, Brandy's from Prince George, and she's uh, one of our uh, um, peer coordinators up there. And they're having internet problems consistently, so. You do? The, they are. <laughs> um, Sandra and Williams Lake asked, uh, is stem cell research focusing on newer SEI, or would it be feasible to use this research to help people with SEI from many years ago? That's an excellent question. I really feel this, uh, Sandra, you nailed it there. Um, I feel personally that more work should be done for those that had chronic injuries and more chronic work. But the uh, difficulty with that is, A, it's very expensive to do chronic studies. That's because you have to house the animals that long. And the uh, common belief is, which I think is actually probably not true, uh, at least not in our hands, is that when you put cells into a chronically injured spinal cord that they are not easily integrating because the scar tissue forms mm -hmm. and they're balled out. So you may not be able to, to get them in there unless you take the scar tissue out and then put the cells in. And this is what I tried to also address earlier on, saying we, we need to do more severe models because these severe models are somewhat mimicking what we see in the scenario when we have to resect the scar tissue and bridge an, an injury site. And we, we actually are, are gearing up experiments exactly in that direction. So we did contusions at eight weeks, and we are now trying to do full transactions and, and, and let them go with resection sites, because that's exactly what we're, in my mind, the, the, the future for stem cells should be. Putting in cells acutely oftentimes gives you some marginally benefits because, and there is mixed reports in the literature, because these cells secrete so-called nourishing factors. They probably are neuroprotective, and they have all these little uh, assets, but I feel that it's very, very costly to use a cell therapy, also risky, to protect the spinal cord. I very much hope that the drug treatments that are being trialed or that are in the pipes for trials are being able to take care of this protection. Mm -hmm. that we don't need to use cells for that. And the other reason was, since there is a risk inherent with all these surgically in, uh, invasive methods, it would be nice to not do them in the first week because of the ethical consent issue I just was mentioning before. And it's typically a cell that comes from the outside, so you have to immunosuppress. So therefore, my personal vision is we should strongly focus on those people that are chronically injured, but initially, there will be that intermediary group, which is in that order of three to six months, which is probably in that subpopulation, the lower hanging fruit, because the, the spinal cord hasn't been quite walled up yet, and the system has not yet chronified so much, so, because there are these scar issues, which are huge. So for that reason, uh, these intermediate time frames will be the first ones, and then from there, we have to push the envelope, of course. Yes. Okay. That's where I see it. Okay. Uh, Brandy, if you're still on, you can go ahead. No, oh, maybe not. So the question that yeah, hi. yeah, hi. Um, okay. The question, yeah, hi. Question from uh, Prince George here. Um, we hear a lot of news reports uh, about uh, you know the latest advancement in spinal cord research and cure, and and we know by now that a lot of these media reports are overblown. And and frankly, I, I think there's a lot of um, fatigue um, on the in the SCI community uh, hearing these stories and then listening to uh, researchers uh, that sort of tell us more about what they don't know than what they do know. And just wondering, in the last couple of years, what significant 
advances have been made in the research community um, to, to, you know, to find a cure or a treatment. Is there anything really new and significant? I think over the last, when you, when you define years like, say, a five to six year time frame, uh, there have been a number of drugs now that entered into clinical trials with, for neuroprotection. Even one in Canada, minocycline is one of them. It was discovered to be neuroprotective in 2003, four. There were four laboratories, including our own. And that was then taken by John Hulbert in Calgary to trials. And the first round of this trial has now been published on the basis of some 50 patients. And a subpopulation there, an incomplete group with cervical injuries, seem to have a very strong trend. Based in that subpopulation was only 10 patients, but definitely very promising so that a larger trial is now being initiated. So that's really, a, a, in my mind, a very good uh, stepping stone to move ahead. But it's, of course, too early to say whether this is panning out, but I'm, I'm quite optimistic there. There's another study which is also made in Canada. Lisa McCarricka discovered a drug, Cetrin, several years ago, which is neuroprotective as well as modulates growth of axons. Again, that went to trial. And again, if you believe the studies and the data that came out of Dr. Failing's lab in Toronto, it looks again quite promising. And again, uh, money is necessary to run the next phase trial to confirm this on a larger patient probe. That drug uh, is, as I said before, is enhancing the sprouting of axons. Uh, by the same token, the Rilazol trial is underway, and we don't know yet. We don't have the data out yet. Um, we hear rumors that, believe it or not, ibuprofen, there is the group at GL is using it, is having some uh, trends. So there are these neuroprotective trials ongoing with some trends. And we have to be cautious, but at least there is some hope that something is panning out. And I think that's actually quite uh, encouraging because in the animal models they work, and the animal models, of course, are very standardized and much easier to actually assess, and it's much easier to get some effects there. But in, to, to get trends in the humans tells us that we might be able either to better understand which people to enroll for which people are these protection treatments are the right treatments, or which kind of injuries are the injuries that are doing better later on with the cell treatment. And as I said before, the cell treatments, there was this trial by Proneuron, which I personally I was very critical of it because they used activated macrophages. And that probably is telling us that's not the way to go, but the, the data are being published soon. Um, Geron was truncated for financial reasons. And uh, we see now the trial ongoing with stem cell ink. So in other words, having done at least a fair amount of preclinical data to convince a group of clinicians and a group of scientists to go ahead for a trial, even if some people say not enough data has been done, uh, and, and, and make progress to understand how to conduct the trial, how to go actually about it, and, and how to actually enroll people and how to do all these rather mundane logistics, is actually major progress because Five years ago, we were completely dumb about this. And that's something which is so necessary. So building the infrastructure for trials and uh, knowing what or learning what are the appropriate outcome measures, what should we look for, what should we uh, avoid, and what mistakes we shouldn't make, and be really realistic about the outcomes is, I think, uh, a major progress. And the field has come to that point, and that has been, in my mind, uh, the, the major change over the last five years, just to answer your question. So on the animal side, we have seen uh, quite some progress, but also in the clinical implementation. But we are not there yet. Absolutely, I agree with you. Great. Um, Marlene has a question there. Are you able to read it? Perfect. About the timelines of research. Marlene, are you there? She is, but she can't uh, talk to you. I haven't uh, turned her audio on. So. I see. Maybe this gentleman has another question. I'm not sure, but... Uh, no, he's done. He's done. Yep. Okay. How would you tell us a little about the timelines of research? How long would it take to cure, for a cure to get on the market? And would it be ahead of the curve 
If, if I would go abroad, would I go? Would I be ahead of? Well, I, I disadvise you at this present time to go abroad unless you think about Switzerland. Uh, and even there, I would say, uh, oh, thank you for making it last much. So the answer is the timelines uh, for the cure. Nobody can give you a clear timeline because we don't know whether these trials will be successful or not. That's very clear. And we can give you timelines in, the, in, the, in a good case scenario. In a good case scenario, let's say the trial in Switzerland has enrolled 12 people by the end of the next year. And then a next round of funding will then essentially have a larger trial in, in multiple centers. And that would need to enroll at least at that time frame of three to six months, at least about 40 patients in order to look at efficacy. So that would take one center, uh, several years, several centers could divide that effort. So to have an answer on the stem cell ink trial, I would say if you're optimistic, three to five years. That's mm -hmm. the reality. And it depends obviously how much funds they can raise for that one. Um, uh, the other trials, the minocycline trial and, and the other trials, the neuroprotection trials, they, they need uh, way larger patient numbers. And again, it depends how many centers you enroll. So the Nectin trial with the North American Network, I don't know exactly what their timeline is, but I would assume it's also in the order of several years. So we have an answer there. So uh, I hope this answers your question. So we have for different uh, ongoing trials, different frames, and we might be able to uh, say after these trials and then concluded effective or not effective. Uh, I, I say that very humbly because we have already tried about uh, half a dozen of drugs in spinal cord injury and only one had a marginal effect and it's no longer used routinely, which is metuprazinolone. And uh, the reason is, of course, there are risks also associated with that. And it's very humbling when you look to the literature of the 90s into the early decade to see how uh, this trial went into phase one, phase two, phase three, just for the lay people out there. Phase one trial is just looking at safety. A phase two trial is looking at early signs of efficacy and trying to uh, uh, have a small clinical study done. And then phase three is disseminating that kind of information into multiple centers and enrolls larger numbers to get definite answers. So the answer is to you, it depends on what you're looking for. Um, and I would think the landscape will be uh, hopefully much different in five years that we have maybe a few things that make patients a little bit better. And this case, I say patients consciously because I talk about acutely injured people with spinal cord injury. For the chronic uh, uh, population, it's very clear the only treatment that works, and we know that, is rehabilitation treatment. And mm -hmm. rehabilitation treatment, in the 90s, people weren't sure what to believe about it. Now we know it's very effective. And the, the rehab crowd has now shown us a very effective way of going ahead in a very small population of individuals, and I know one so far, and I hear there's another one, um, where they use the combination of electrical stimulation mm -hmm. with uh, rehab training. And in some people, very athletic, very motivated ones, which had some walking capabilities, it made a huge difference. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, we have to be very cautious here. These are very small cohorts, and it's highly, highly resource demanding again. But uh, we could learn from these studies how to apply this in an effective way, how to be able to uh, tween those individuals that are likely responding to this as opposed to the others, and then bring this type of approach out uh, to the population. Again, this will take several years, but I feel there is great progress being made in that area, and I, I'm very optimistic about that. Does that answer your question? Oh, you, you asked something else here uh, yes, about so going so, going okay. elsewhere. Ah, I have another question. Are you, are you, another to question to, from, Prince from Prince George. Yeah, uh, what, in your opinion, yeah what, what in your opinion is the major stumbling blocks to finding a cure? Is it is it knowledge? Is it the science? Um, around the mechanisms of the spinal cord, or is it funding? What, what is it that is the stumbling block for an, an accelerated sort of improvements in this area? It's, it's all of the above, because you're absolutely correct. We don't know enough. 
we need to do more science to understand, in particular, uh, the injured spinal cord, be it the secondary injury cascade, and how to intervene it to identify the best targets for treatment, but also to understand how the cord, the partially injured cord, could actually be enhanced to recover itself and, and, and tap into those mechanisms, which at the moment I alluded to it, is just using a very crude epidural stimulation, so really with understanding of those mechanisms. Plus, you're absolutely correct, uh, you, need more, you need more science, and at that moment you need more money. It's very clear. So if you would look at a laboratory like, like my own here, and I don't want to be self-servant here, we have essentially lined up experiments for the next two years, which we have to go through as milestones. But if I had five times as much money, I would be done in May. And so there, that's, that's the reality. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we have the facility. We have the room. We have even the, the skilled people to do the surgery because that surgeon is doing that only for a week for each of these experiments. But it takes a long time then to assess the animals, to see how they recovered, lots of man manpower to do all these behavioral testing and so on and so on. So really, it's, it's a funding. Uh, and it's a mixture of both because we all have good ideas. We all have uh, something we like to try out because there's good evidence for this and that. And yet, we need at the same time, as, as, as we are applied scientists in the animal laboratories, we need at the same time also more basic science. And there are very good basic science ideas already out there which need to be implemented. And again, it's a matter of funding. Excellent. Thank you. So, uh, Altera. Sure. Uh, I have two questions. One of them is related to your last answer. Um, I'm just curious, personally, for some of the like larger multi-center trials, um, is ethics approval for different centers a big barrier to some of the like net more networked trials, or is that not an issue? No, it is an issue. You, 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 need to, you need to go through the each IRB and confront them with what you like to yeah. do. Uh, it's, but it's usually not an unsurmountable barrier. It's more like a, a bureaucratic slowdown. And by and large, the cent these people on the IRBs are sympathetic. Um, my next question was, I noticed at the beginning of your presentation that you had a sick um, So yes. I, was, I was wondering, so are you recruiting for some of these Our trials? Collaborate. No, we don't recruit. I don't do clinical trials. We do. Right. Our clients are rats and mice. Right. So it's the cells, scientists? the cells from the skin that were discovered at Sickett. Okay. And Dr. Frieda Miller uh, had a crew in her laboratory, and these uh, postdocs and research associates did the early work on these cells, okay. and we entered into a collaboration with Dr. Frieda Miller. Uh, as the spinal cord laboratory, and we actually get physically sent these cells. They fly by plane, and yes, we are one of the few people that can go with liquid on a plane <laughs> with, a lot of, with a lot of bureaucracy. <laughs> uh, actually, you and the uh, babies. Uh, maybe, yes, yeah. yeah. We're allowed to bring Baby bottles and, yes. and nutrients for cells. That's exactly right, yes. So that's the answer, yeah. Okay. So there's a, a couple questions that we've had um, typed out here. Uh, Scott and Victoria had, uh, just let me. It up here. I think there's a good question there. I'd like to answer that one. Okay. This one. Okay. When you speak of the role of stem cells, you say that the ideal set would repair the myelin, another would bridge the. Oops, sorry. Uh, scroll down. Yeah, it just says uh, someone keeps typing. So. Another would bridge the lesion site, and still another replace the lost nerve cells. What is that? You scroll too fast. Sorry. Oh, it's not me, it's when people type. I, it, it moves I think it it's an own. excellent question. I don't know what, where it goes to, but I can actually see that already. Um, let me tell you, there are some cells talented enough to do more than one of these functions. Given that you're using undifferentiated cells for transplantation, no, we are not. Uh, we are looking for a hopeful monster in those stem cells, becoming what we want them to be once transplanted. Or is there a way to control what, the, uh, what those undifferentiated cells do become? That's an excellent question. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. The, the truth is, when you have an undifferentiated cell like a stem cell, you don't want it. When you take an undifferentiated neural stem cell that can is restricted now to make neurons or myelinating cells, you have to learn, and this is the stage of the art, you have to learn what are the conditions in which these cells are now turning into nerve cells, neurons, or turning into a myelinating cell and 
Can we exploit and harness that? And this is the, where the, the, the science is at the moment, where we actually, sewing them in is not sufficient. Oftentimes they die, and if they get into the lesion site, they make those scar forming cells. So we really have to learn how to cleverly apply them. We like to use a cell which is, does at least two things. It's not replacing the nerve cells, but for many injuries, they, they should be able to do two things. And we see that they make the myelin, those insulators, and they make those bridges because they can bridge the lesion sites. We might have to combine them with some immature neuronal cells. But these are the, the, the questions we have to still answer and learn to optimize these type of techniques. And in particular, we have to learn this because Oftentimes, cells are not that viable in an injured spinal cord and mm -hmm. undergo uh, death and only a small fraction survives. So you don't want the monster cell, no. You want an immature neural type cell and you want a cell that is able to do these functions that you can then influence when, after you put it in or pre-differentiate it in the dish before you put it in. And these are questions people are working on, including ourselves. Perfect, thank you. Uh, uh, there was another question from Scott earlier on, and it was uh, more related about stem cell tourism. And that particular one, Marlene, who's actually joined us, uh, talked about that in fair detail. And I'll be posting that presentation um, hopefully this next month once we organize our YouTube channel a little bit more with all the other ones we've done. So I'll leave that one for that particular session. But there was a really good question here from Roderick. I'll just uh, pull it up here a little bit. It had to do more with the treatment of electrostimulation and physiotherapy that you, you just touched on briefly there about the acute yeah. versus. Yeah. Um, these are not treatments yet that are available for the public. These are research results for the electrostimulation, for instance, in the laboratory of Dr. Susan Harkamar in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, I bet you she gets swamped with requests of mm -hmm. highly motivated individuals who want to participate there. Uh, and I do not know what the capacity is of this laboratory to enroll more than a handful of people. Okay. So this is something where, again, the resources become an issue. Absolutely. But I'm very optimistic that this technology will be exploited in the near future. We like to actually re-import it for our animals to see how the combination of cell transplantation and electrical stimulation is actually enhancing the success of the transplantation because one you can do already in the human and the other one is then essentially the new treatment, the cell treatment, and it may actually instruct those nerve fibers that grow through to make meaningful connections. And that's uh, one of the uh, thinking behind it. Now let's answer the next question. Also, you mentioned there are credible trials on human stem cell treatment in other countries. Yes. Are these results uh, of these studies being published or are there any? Okay. If you go to the literature, you will see, and if you dismiss everything which has less than 10 patients enrolled, you see about a dozen, about 12 uh, reported clinical studies or, uh, on humans. And the vast majority of them is on bone marrow cells, the cells that are isolated from the bone marrow. And they contain oftentimes a mixture of bone marrow blood stem cells and of so-called mesenchymal cells. Those are cells which are surrounding these blood stem cells. The animal researchers like to separate those functions and like to understand each population by themselves. But the human trials are not often as clean. Nevertheless, um, these trials have been done in, in, in at least eight or nine of these clinics and published, some of them with 50, 80 patients, some of them with even over 200. And the overbearing result is in several of these studies is that there are mild sensory recoveries, meaning that the Individuals treated were able to feel a bit more below the lesion site. Um, there is very little in with regard to motor improvement. There are two of them actually do actually have those claims, but we don't really know because they were early enough uh, and early studied and not blind, and there were other confounding factors. We don't really know whether these are true recoveries of motor function and how meaningful they are. Oftentimes, the, the Asia points on the scale of 100 was just two points, it was mm -hmm. relatively minor. That alone, being, that being said, uh, it seems like it's a safe treatment 
and larger trials, which are blinded and controlled and randomized, seem to be warranted to actually nail this now further. Because at the time, for at the moment, we cannot conclude in any uh, certain way whether these treatments are effective or not. But they have a risk. Several studies pointed out that there was a significant number of individuals that not only had sensory recovery, but mm -hmm. also had more pain. And that is something you want to hesitate uh, a lot because being able to maybe wiggle the toe, but being now in pain from a complete paralyzed state before may actually be uh, hell because uh, pain is such a difficult thing to treat. And therefore, we have to caution because we don't understand really what happened in these trials and what these cells did. And the wisdom is from the animal experiment, these bone marrow cells don't survive. They don't integrate in anything which is nerve cell-like or bridging or uh, myelinating. There are claims for that, but we believe these claims are artifacts. They are not credible. So the point is, I can elaborate to that if people want to know that. But the point is, there is risk involved. And there are risks involved. And we need to really randomize this, be a bit more um, cold blooded mm -hmm. about the facts that mm -hmm. are out there and then see what, what what is happening. And I'm pretty sure people are in the process of, of doing that. It may not happen in North America. It may happen again in countries like India or China and so on. But again, those data from those countries becoming better. The important is... Uh, in the past, we had to constantly hammer the necessity of randomized controls. And some of these researchers are now coming around to that, some of mm -hmm. them not. And if you don't have a randomized control, the ultimate conclusion is simply not possible. So that's that's the reality. So, And also, if you receive money for your yep. trials, mm -hmm. <laughs> this is not tourism, you're yes. biased because you're yes. kind of selling something, yeah. selling a product. And that is usually... Uh, it's not only unethical, it's just these people are lying in their own pocket. They may believe it, but they also sell oftentimes their cells with a very aggressive physiotherapy regimen. Yes. And these people feel yes. invigorated. These yes. people feel stronger when they come back because they have been exercised, they've been worked through. And of course, they're fitter. Then once they're home and they go into the old routine again, within very few weeks, they say, I haven't really done much. And But they spent a lot of money. Yes. And in the scenario which we oftentimes see people collecting money from their friends, from their family, and their return. And of course, everybody said, so I give you all that money and you're telling me you're not better. They don't dare to tell this to them. So they're making up, uh, imagined or not, effects. And sometimes these effects may be real, with some of the sensory function, mm -hmm. or maybe the wiggling of the toe, that may be real in some cases. But uh, on much of it is initially probably related to the good rehabilitation and training and I would think if you could maintain that here that would be very good right and so would, and that is of course something which we have to sort through and I rather feel that this controlled serious trials are now in order to actually give us definite answers about those cells so here I'm um, going back to or coming back to Canada and coming back to our healthcare system um, you, you've touched upon, you know, intense physical therapy. Uh, well, we all know that acutely has benefits also, but, uh, you know, months or years later. Um, are there any plans or anything ongoing right now to, to look at uh, intensive rehab for spinal cord and uh, mobility gains and that sort of idea? I think and how much, sorry, my, the, the second part of my question is that if there are, what's the sort of percentage of funding that's going into stem cell research versus non-stem cell research? It's actually probably the other way around. I cannot give you the numbers. Okay. I can only speak for our own institution. And at our own institution, there are only in i -Code, there are only two laboratories working on the animal side of, mm -hmm. of stem cells. That's my own laboratory mm -hmm. and uh, by one to some extent with the pig model. Yet we have several laboratories, Tanya Lam and Janice Ang and others, and uh, Boris Zubatsky, who work on uh, rehabilitation issues. Yes. And the group is actually much bigger. So I would say we are very strong here in Vancouver on the clinical side of things and, and trying to uh, address everyday issues of people with spinal cord injury.
So the numbers, actually, I cannot break down for you to give. Oh you no, but just a just a guesstimate. The, no, past, the best possible. Yeah, and the guesstimate is of, always that uh, each side wants would like to see more. That's very obvious. And each side could immediately tell you, oh, we have these wonderful projects going on, and if we get more money, we would be able to do this and this and this. True. And that's so true. And so the dilemma really is, uh, and it boils down to then again the limitations of funds for mm -hmm. the actual research projects and. But you also uh, addressed in your question, how much does Health Canada provide? Well, you know yourself, if, you, if somebody's injured with spinal cord injury, you, you get re-up for a certain time, and at some point you fall off mm -hmm. to some extent, and mm -hmm. you get a relative minimum. And that by itself is something one has to question and ask, uh, should that be improved? And of course, I'm all in favor of that, but I am not making those policies. No, and I'm a stem cell person, uh, and I cannot really speak for uh, with any competence to what we should be doing and what the funds are there and all this. But if we can raise money for that, that would be nice. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, Scott has another question there. I'll just highlight it for you. That's right here. In the case of nerve cells being made from stem cell implement, implantation, are you finding synaptic connections being made effectively with pre-existing nerve cells? Yeah, good point. Um, this is work not done by me. Yes, the answer is yes. And it has been done so far effectively in a model of respiration. In other words, we have in our neck uh, respiratory centers that go out to the diaphragm. And we know when the cervical spinal cord is injured at C4, C3, that these nerve cells are compromised, and when the level is higher, the actual phrenic motor neurons still survive, but the networks to them, the connections are interrupted. And people have now put in, as this is early work, some neural stem cell-like cells, which can differentiate the neurons, and they have shown that there is synaptic, there are synaptic connections. This is work done in Paul Weyers and Michael Lane's lab in Florida. Mm -hmm. And these people are now following up on this kind of findings. And this is a very simple uh, pattern generator for breathing pattern, relative simple movement. When you think about this, you go in and out and in and out. It's not a complicated movement. And they see in animal models exactly these type of integrations. And uh, it's, it's highly exciting because it shows us that, that neuronal replacement therapy is possible. We also saw on Friday a paper in a high-profile journal, Cell, in which people used neural stem cells, and it looks like a large portion of them was with a cocktail of factors that gave them uh, maintaining a neuronal phenotype. And what they did is they actually did full transactions of the rat spider cords and put these cells into the region side, and these cells are able to grow into the uh, host spinal cord, and they receive synapses from the host mm -hmm. cells. So the hope is that these are able to produce relays and make these animals walk. The answer is they don't, uh, not yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the actual outcome of that experiment, despite the high profile publication, is not better than if you take Schwann cells, which I talked about before, and put those in a full transaction site and uh, make those animals walk. So therefore, uh, we have to still learn a lot about these cells. It looks quite spectacular in the animal experiments, but the functional benefits so far would not justify to do it in the human. And we have to learn more about it. The problem is also when you have a whole bunch of cocktails of factors, you have to go through this mm -hmm. uh, one by one because the FDA will not allow mm -hmm. you to just throw them on as a mixture. They want to have safety for each component yes. you're putting in there. And that makes it really a, a logistic nightmare to actually translate that. So um, I'm just going to uh, redirect you to a question uh, Arlene wrote, but it's actually a question from Scott. So uh, here, I'll just highlight it for you. This one right here. So I would, I would like to re-ask the question that Victoria asked before. When a person travels abroad, they are going for stem cell treatment here in Canada. There are trials or research going on. What is the difference, if any, of what has been done here versus abroad? We have no cell trial in Canada. Okay. The, cell, the, the trials in Canada are for acutely injured people with spinal cord injury using drugs like minocycline, using 
drugs like Cetrin. I'm not even sure whether they're enrolling at the moment, but I, I hope they do because they raised the money for that, and I believe Minusak and Vilgo in, in phase three now. Uh, but the the answer is the when people travel abroad, they most likely are going for some stem cell treatment in one of those small clinics outside the Mexican border mm -hmm. or in some of those jurisdictions which are very relaxed. And none of these treatments is proven. None of these treatments is even uh, remotely, uh, for our perspective, remotely uh, backed up by more than a few scientific papers that have some animal data that would suggest that there is some evidence for this. So therefore, because what they do is oftentimes they just take cells out, centrifugate them, and then four hours later put them in. Hmm. There are few clinics which are a little bit better than that. Uh, they, they go through the effort of, of culturing them and separating them better, but the vast majority is not. And there are huge claims laid by these clinics with regards to successes. I mentioned it before, the, the, the effect is often the placebo or rehab effect, because these are often sold as packages with some rehab training or with some other things. So this being said, so a person that goes out to a stem cell treatment is very much at risk of A, getting infections, very much at risk of getting uncharacterized cells, very much at risk of coming back home with pain and most likely not any benefit here. So if you take that money and, and get a good uh, uh, physio training in case you have a partial injury, I think you have a better investment there. Right. So I would, I, would, I would not go there. Okay. So there's another question there from Connor. I'm not sure if uh, it says, if organizations that receive money for spinal cord injury improvement and need to decide how much is spent percentage-wise up, I'm, I'm, I'm not think... complete. Okay. How much goes for for infrastructure and upgrade versus research? Yeah, that's a very okay. very good question. I I personally think we have to go in both directions pretty much because there is a population of us who is not injured yet but might become injured tomorrow, and we have a responsibility for those acutely injured ones. Yes. And we have a responsibility for those who have an injury already and have everyday problems, be it the bowel routine, be it the infections, be it the pain they suffer from, be it the desire to, to father children or mother children. Those issues are really big issues. And yet, we, it's not just a paralysis. Yes. Uh, and, 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 and yet, we have not even good solutions to offer for, for those type of things. And I think, in my mind, we should just split the resources and definitely, definitely put resources to, to address these chronic issues. And at the same time, don't forget that there will be tomorrow another in North America, when you think about 10,000 a year, there will be essentially another couple of hundred, uh, tens or 20, 30, whatever patients that yes. are injured. And we need to have some treatments at some point for the acute ones, for the subacute ones, and hopefully some of that, what we learn, is then also usable for repair strategies in the chronic situations of the others. So my personal take on this is usually a 50-50 split. Mm -hmm. And other people may say that should be differently allotted. That's a long discussion we could have. And, uh, but I can see why both sides have uh, their perspective. And if I would be already injured for several years, I would, of course, like to see more money mm -hmm. on that side. But I think everybody in the population has a right to demand research toward acute injury because chances are some of us will be injured. And that's something which we shouldn't overlook either. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, just to direct you again to another point from Marlene there. So it says, uh, so if I summarize what you're saying is that there is a different promise Mark, treatment promises a cure or improvement versus trials and research offering a possibility to contribute to science? Well, we, we, we never would promise a person or a patient an, a, a cure. That is in itself not morally correct. I think what you promise is a better outcome with the treatment as opposed to if left untreated. Yes. That's very clear. And we should not believe that 
the, the tr treatment results will be so dramatic, and this is really an important issue here, uh, and people oftentimes overestimate the effect sizes and the perception of a person who agrees into a stem cell trial and, and what the gain may be and what clinicians think is already a significant improvement. It's actually not the same. There's actually quite some spectrum of different expectations, even towards some of them thinking it's the cure that they're completely yes. walk. Uh, and, yep. and it really depends on the type of injury, of course. So the answer is the treatments that are going to be developed, there will be small incremental cures, which in addition to the cures on the chronic side of things, will make very significant differences for the quality of life. Hopefully, that's what we are hoping. That's right. But we cannot promise this, of course, yes. but this is not a, a single cure, yeah. just to say that very clear. So Trials right. versus research versus treatments. Well, at the moment, we are at a stage where we haven't gotten anything except of a way of training. And of course, the surgeons do the stabilization surgery and the intensive care doctors are rescuing people more than they ever did in the past, so therefore people survive. But true trials are the responsible conduct in which we randomize ideally and therefore are having scenarios where we can completely unbiased con draw conclusions from. And this is research. And the research in the basic side is of course what we do with randomized animals. Our clinical studies, oh, sorry, our animal studies are in a way preclinical studies because we randomize our animals, mm -hmm. we blind ourselves to the outcome and so on. Um, the treatments you see in centers all over the world, of course, you know that very much as I do, they are neither tr trials because they're not really documenting very well and following up very well, nor are they validated treatments. So they're really some strange business operation offering uh, some cell injections or treatments for people, but they're not uh, qualified as trials because to have a trial, you have to fulfill a certain set of criteria. And in the literature, we are typically categorized in class one, two, three, four, five evidence. They're not even making those classes because they're not even following up properly on their people. And therefore, they're neither science, they're just a money-making organization. Mm -hmm. That's very sad. So let's go to your question again. Um, so if I summarize what you're saying, is there a different promise? promise? But I think I think that question goes to a point that we were discussing earlier yeah. about when we were talking about the cure, that there's a there's a different, there's a misconception about what the cure for some researches are versus a cure for what a person with a spinal cord. Yes. We were talking about cures for, for on, on a smaller scale, yeah. addressing uh, respiratory problems, Forms. hand function. Yeah. And that's uh, that's very true what you say. And, and there is probably, which we really have to come also to this mechanistic uh, thinking in the research side, is that every person is different. And this is something which we really are, are clued into also from the animal side over the last years. Uh, by thinking about the mechanistic way, how the spinal cord is becoming injured. And different injury mechanisms have a different impact on the cord, and the different parts of the cord are becoming injured oftentimes. And that would uh, necessitate the actual development of animal models. And we have engineers like Dr. Oxlade's group who are able to simulate these animal models. And ICOT is really in, in that good position that we bring engineers together with uh, spinal cord scientists. And these folks are now able to simulate what the clinicians tell us, oh, this is a distraction injury or dislocation injury or contusion injury by just describing the mechanism how the spinal cord got injured. We are now taking this to the animal models with the help of these engineers. And most likely we have to learn that certain types of injuries will lend themselves to certain types of treatments more right. than others. Right. So we have to do a lot of research to be able to then say, OK, this would be the best way to randomize in the future. And there will be a personalized approach to spinal cord treatments. And therefore, uh, uh, it might be necessary to, to venture out and, 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 and
screen everybody and understand this. Mm -hmm. The clinicians have to do a lot of work on their side in the imaging to understand what they're seeing in the images, what they're seeing functionally, and to understand the lesion side better. And they're now recruiting more techniques like electrophysiology as well as imaging, in addition to the uh, traditional methods where the patient is asked to move the muscles against gravity. And in those set, uh, settings, we, we probably come to a more personalized approach to treatment. Okay, so Scott and Victoria, uh, so what I'm hearing is that trial and research is working toward a functional cure, a quote-unquote fix to the injury in the long term. But what is happening abroad is the sale of an unknown, the hype, the hope that whatever it is that they are doing is going to help. So I, that's just, you know. Now we, have, we cannot influence what is mm -hmm. happening abroad. We can only uh, give you guys our own opinion and warn you to participate and I can see that people get impatient and get desperate and say, I'd rather try it and take all the risks uh, and see what is in for me. Um, uh, looking into this, I, I just don't see it. I mm -hmm. just don't see the effect. And I would, personally, if I had the money, I would give it to my, my rehab trainer <laughs> if, I, if I had to pay for it, right? So uh, provided I'm, I'm, I'm partially injured, if I'm completely injured, the chances are those cells do nothing. Yes. Absolutely nothing. So there is this very small group of people with a, with a partial injury which come back and say, ah, oh, maybe there's some sensory function, but it could be pain, it could be discomfort, and it's risky. I wouldn't do it. And the, as I said before, the risk of infection is there, and no. So this is what you, what you, what you see offered in those third world clinics, or second world clinics, I should say, mm -hmm. um, is in my mind, what summarized as stem cell tourism, is in my mind, scientifically and ethically highly problematic. So, so um, we're getting really close to wrapping it up here. So do um, are there any other questions that uh, any of the participants want to ask Wolf here? And I'll just give it a couple of seconds. And uh, while while we're waiting here, I just want to say thank you and uh, for taking the time. And, and, and what we've, we've had here today is a uh, in some really good information on things that we haven't really talked about or heard about before. And um, yeah, it's been really interesting. And it's been great to have this sort of opportunity, uh, you know, to uh, just talk to you personally. And we've had some really good questions from everybody in the regions here. And just to show you, um, we have representation here from pretty much most parts of the province. So interesting. Uh, so it's been a really good participation so today. So how many people are out there? Um, we had, we'd probably have about 20 people online I see. in total. The yeah. numbers right there just don't represent exactly everybody. Yeah. Um, and what happens is that uh, some people sign on and then they, they log off and they come back or yeah. we get new ones uh, yeah. coming in, but in yeah. total we've had more than that. So it's been, it's been a really good uh, representat representation from everybody and everyone's had some, uh, some really good questions out there. So Yes, and yeah, and Scott and Victoria yes. has um, he's in the off Large our office people. there, and he's I can uh, see that, yeah. he has quite a few people there. And same same thing with Brandy and Prince George. Yeah. Um, so, well, it was nice to meet you all out there. I hope it helped. If you have any questions, you can email me as well with questions. My email address is tetslav at icord dot org. Uh, icord is a research organization here in Vancouver, uh, comprised of clinicians rehabilitation scientists and basic animal scientists like ourselves. Uh, we are housed in the Blue Sun Pavilion next to General Hospital. And we all address spinal cord injury from different angles. And by bringing people from different disciplines together under one roof, we actually understand better the issues of the clinicians and what is translation really mean. And, and mm -hmm. we get that impression. But they also understand more what the animal scientists are all about. and they're trying, therefore, to build those synergies. And it is these type of synergies which really is, in my mind, uh, the, the, the fertilized bed for future discoveries and, and for developments for these cures, which are mm -hmm. probably multiple of them. And those are incremental steps, obviously. But when you bring them all together, hopefully they will make differences, big difference for the quality of life in the future, we hope. Perfect. And that's exactly what, uh, what all these sessions are about. You know, we, we, we want everyone to learn as much as possible uh, because you never know when you might get that nugget of information that have a difference in someone's quality of life. Those breakthroughs, whenever something yes. is, is hailed as a breakthrough, it's usually the journalists that feel 
they have to come up with a new story. It's not so much my scientific colleagues. They're embarrassed oftentimes. I, I go yes. up to them and say, hey, you had yes. some media blitz here, right? <laughs> and then, then, then they say, oh, God, no, yeah. I wish it wouldn't <laughs> happen because it's the journalists. They like to hype things up. Mm -hmm. And uh, although, this being said, I, I take it back. We had a big thing about some rehab things in, in science in the, earlier this summer. And the, the scientist was saying that these animals recovered with this rehab regimen uh, with, with injuries that happen in humans, but these were staggered lesions, like one cut here, one cut here on the spinal cord, they don't happen in humans like that. Yeah. Maybe one in 100,000. And so uh, that was a bit sad. Yeah. So there was actually sometimes uh, the odd colleague also at, uh, in my mind, at fault, but usually it's the journalism. Yeah. Usually it's the press out there, and th that is something you have very little control over because they interview you, and you put all these cautionary statements in there, and they run with the bone. Yeah. And they don't want to acknowledge that there is actually a lot of qualifiers being mentioned in a discussion with you. Nope, you get this 30 seconds. Yeah. It's not good. So next month, um, I just uh, I can't remember what uh, the webinar's topic is next month, so if someone can just type out a quick one. OK, thank you. So uh, same. T same time of the month, same time of the day. Uh, log on for um, a little bit more information about spasticity and Botox and how uh, some people are using Botox to help them with their spasticity. Just for yes. So yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you just took that one right out. So I was hoping I'm getting more people. You know, the the whole facial thing and yeah, absolutely. So well, maybe we can do a combination of the, of the two. You know, can I make a suggestion? Absolutely. Can I make a suggestion to have the camera not up there, but rather on the table, because it's very tough on the neck. I find to look up there all the time. Yeah, no. That, but if it would be here, yeah. I would feel I could actually talk to my my, my my other person. But having the neck up there is actually rather tedious. Yeah, you know no, what I mean? Absolutely. No, that's a good point. I I've, I've actually been uh, thinking about doing that. Is that when we first installed the system, we weren't sure how it all would work out. I think the so, camera of us could be there, but maybe there. So what my idea is to move the TV up and put the camera a little bit lower, so yeah, you're directing like into yeah. it. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, but we're getting better. Uh, the quality has definitely improved over the last number of months of, of our, you know, not only the the system itself, but the presenters also. Everyone's getting used to. It. We're doing a. I think we're all doing a fantastic job um, on the system. So thank you again, everyone, for joining and. Uh, you're very welcome, and thanks again to Will for joining us and for taking the time. You're very welcome, and thanks for everybody for your questions, which I felt were really excellent points. Thank you so much. Okay, so we're logging off here.